County Economic Development Corporation. Um, please, when you do uh, speak, we wanna make sure that uh, the recording captures you. So please just say your name and your school um, that you are representing or the entity in general that you're representing. The other piece that I would ask is that since we are moving forward with this conversation now, if you could, just so we can get our representation on the call in the chat box, if you could take this time to actually just put your first and last name maybe, or even just your first name, and then the Los Angeles Community College, County Community College that you are representing. Um, in addition to that, I do have my colleagues on the call as well. Um, Jose Palayo, Program Manager, Workforce Development, and Mariana Hernandez, Assistant Program Manager, Workforce Development, and then also our VP uh, as well of Workforce and Economic Development, Larry Holt, will be joining us as well. Um, this conversation is meant to um, obviously impact the colleges, um, not only in collaboration um, with the Los Angeles Regional Consortium, but obviously in, in partnership with uh, the Center of Excellence through Mount SAC, and then also obviously um, the Los Angeles County Economic Development Corporation and our industry partners that we're bringing to the table as well. Um, please be mindful that this conversation is meant to be a dialogue. Um, we wanna work together to create solutions. We wanna talk about challenges and opportunities as well. And so please, you know, definitely, you know, come off mute and talk about some of the things that you have going on. Um, as they come about in the conversation. Um, the, the presentation will start off with, uh, like I said before, the research and data um, from our two different entities. One will be the Institute of Applied Economics here at LEDC. We'll have a present presentation and then also the Center of Excellence will have a presentation as well on behalf of the colleges. And so without further ado, uh, once again, thank you all so much and thank you to all our partners that are joining the call. Um, and thank you to obviously all the presidents and deans and faculty across the LA-19 colleges. And we truly appreciate this partnership um, and working with you um, as we try to push um, opportunities um, and build talent pipelines here in LA County. And without further ado, I wanna bring up Dr. McKeegan from the Los Angeles Regional Consortium. Thank you. Thank you, Jermaine. Hello, everyone. I'm Narina McKeegan, Chair and Assistant Vice President of the Los Angeles Regional Consortium. Just want to thank Jermaine and the entire LAEDC team for their partnership, collaboration, and support in putting these amazing program advisories on in collaboration with us and really helping to support workforce development in our region. Um, as most of you know, the Los Angeles Regional Consortium consists of the 19 community colleges in LA County, and truly our mission is to bridge the gap between LA's workforce and employers fueling our cutting edge economy. And our objective is to address the skills gap by increasing availability of well-trained skilled workforce in LA County. And we know that this will not only close the supply and demand gap, but it will also increase economic and social mobility for our LA County residents. So LARC is truly dedicated in offering leadership on career education initiatives within the region with truly a focus on equity and through collaboration with educators, industry experts, and community partners, we strive to really support our students, foster a skilled workforce and adapt to the needs of their regional ecosystem. And lastly, I'll just like to thank Luke Meyer, our Centers of Excellence Director, um, for his unwavering dedication to our region and our LA-19 colleges. And a big thank you to our industry partners today for collaborating with our community college programs and helping our students gain the necessary knowledge and skills for their chosen careers. And finally, I wanna you know, give my sincere gratitude to our LA-19 faculty, staff, our CEOs, our deans, and everyone for their support and for all the work that they do day to day and the invaluable contributions they provide for student success and career preparation. So thank you so much. and. Excited to see everyone here. Thank you, Dr. McKeesian. And with that, I'll go ahead and introduce our employer partners, starting off with Linda Nguyen, a community engagement lead for Microsoft. At Microsoft Philanthropies, Linda leads digital inclusion and transformation initiatives in underserved communities and underestimated individuals. Next, we have Anika Aduesa Smart, GIS Director for LA Metro. As the first GIS director at LA Metro, she recently created the One Map program, a modern pragmatic approach that has already begun to change the way the agency meets its business objectives. 
We also have Sydney Davis, California lead for education for social impact at Google. Sydney has worked at Google for a little over a decade, first in campus recruiting and outreach, and then in technical education program and curriculum development. And last but not least, we have Justin Washington, lead product manager at Apple TV+. Justin Washington is a creative technologist with over 10 years of product and engineering experience in consumer hardware and software, social, fine tech, music, and photography. And with that, I'll go ahead and introduce our senior economist at the Institute of Applied Economics at LAEDC, Justin Adams. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Justin Adams. I'm senior economist at LAEDC's Institute for Applied Economics. Um, thanks for attending this regional program advisory focusing on the information and communications technology industry, which I'm just going to shorthand uh, ICT industry. Um, today, I'll be sharing information on a number of aspects of the ICT industry, including the current landscape of ICT employment, industry employment projections, trends regarding job postings, industry worker demographics, and the characteristics of target occupations. So this will be an extensive look at the demand side of the ICT industry uh, labor market. Um, before we get started though, let's take a quick look at how we define the ICT industry. We're specifying the industry as comprising um, 10 different sub-industries. And these include commercial printing, radio and TV broadcasting and wireless communications equipment manufacturing, electronic shopping and mail order houses, software publishers, wired and wireless telecommunications carriers, data processing, hosting and related services, internet publishing and web search browsers, custom computer programming, computer systems, design services, and then finally uh, corporate subsidiary and managing offices. Okay, so let's jump in. Next slide, please. Okay, um, Los Angeles County employment in the ICT industry has grown from nearly 133,000 in 2011 to almost 168,000 in 2021. And this steadily upward trend has grown on average about 2.6% a year. Uh, next slide, please. So here we see how the distribution in employment across the 10 sub-industries has evolved from 2011 to 2021. So we see that in 2021, uh, the three largest sub-industries were software publishers, internet publishing and web search browsers, and custom computer programming. And combined, these three accounted for roughly 39% of the total of total employment. These three sub-industries um, Remain well, I should say that so those were the, the largest ones in 2011. Um, they remained the three largest in 2021, although um, uh, software publishers and internet publishing and web search browsers swapped positions over that time. But overall, these three sub industries accounted for 43% of total employment in 2021. Okay, next slide. So here we see average annual pay for the 10 sub-industries. Uh, it ranges from $63,440 for commercial printing, all the way to nearly $231,000 for internet publishing and web search browsers. Overall, um, pay in the ICT industry averaged over $143,000. This compares to the average salary of $66,000 for all of LA County. Next slide, please. So here we're looking at real wage growth in the ICT industry. Um, as a whole, um, real wages have grown 30% since 2011. So that's growth adjusted for inflation. But we can see that this growth varied across the different sub-industries. Um, internet publishing and web search browsers saw the largest growth of a about 76% over this time, 
while radio and TV broadcasting and wireless communications and equipment manufacturing saw the smallest growth at only around 10%. Next slide. So looking forward, we see um, projections show that employment in the ICT industry uh, is expected um, to grow from roughly 168,000 in 2021 to just over 180,000 in 2028. So that works out to an increase of about 7.3% or average annual, annual growth of just over 1%. Uh, next slide, please. So employment growth, though, is not expected to be uniform across all 10 sub-industries. Um, we see that electronic shopping and mail order houses, data processing, hosting, and related services, and internet publishing and web search browsers will all see employment growth north of 20%. Um, by contrast, wired and wireless telecommunications carriers and commercial printing are actually both expecting to see significant contractions through 2028. Next slide, please. Okay, let's turn to employer job postings. So employer job postings for the ICT industry have increased from about 12,000 all the way back in 2012 to over 49,000 in 2022. Um, we can see that this growth has not been entirely steady over this time. So we see dips in 2016 and 17, as well as in uh, 2020. Um, nevertheless, the growth has been significant. The three um, sub-industries that are responsible for about 61% of these postings um, are custom computer programming, computer systems design services, and software publishers. Next slide, please. Okay, so here we see job postings broken out by sub-industry um, from 2012 to 2022. And uh, I admit there's a lot going on in this slide, but if you focus on the years um, 2019 to 2022, so the last four years, you kind of see the emergence of four top sub-industries. These include custom computer programming, electronic shopping and mail order houses, software publishers, and computer systems design services. Okay, next slide. Uh, th these are where we're seeing the, um, where we saw the most um, employer job postings uh, in the ICT industry in LA County in 2022. Uh, they include uh, the gamers, so Activision and Blizzard and Riot Games, we see Amazon, uh, Accenture, and also T-Mobile. Uh, next slide. Okay, so let's turn to industry demographics. Um, here we see that um, it's a really interesting slide. Here we see that the uh, ICT industry has roughly the same percentage of workers who are less than 39 years old as do all other industries in Los Angeles County. But what's striking is that really almost 48% of employees in the ICT industry are between uh, 25 and 39 years old. So about 25 percentage points more than in other industries. Um, ITC workers uh, also, or ICT workers, also have uh, a greater share of workers in the 50, in the 40 to 54 age uh, band. Next slide. Compared to uh, jobs in other industries, uh, ICT industry jobs um, are not as accessible to workers who uh, who only hold a high school diploma or have less than a high school diploma. We, um, oh, back up please. Um, so I would just point out that 44% uh, of employees uh, in these industries have a bachelor's uh, degree, which is um, about 20 percentage points higher than, uh, than jobs in, the, in other industries in LA County. 
Uh, next slide. Okay, looking at uh, the racial and ethnic distribution of workers in the ICT industry, uh, we see that uh, Hispanic, uh, Latino, Asian, and Black workers are, are all underrepresented uh, compared to all other industries in LA County. Um, next slide. Um, here, uh, looking at gender distribution, we also see that female workers are also um, underrepresented relative to all industries in LA County. And here we turn to um, target occupations. Um, these occupations um, are really uh, accessible to workers with uh, some college or an associate's degree or a bachelor's degree. Um, with really about 75 to 82% of workers in these occupations um, with these kind of similar levels of, of education. Uh, so these target occupations, oh, thank you. Uh, target occupations are computer support specialists, network and computer systems administrators, information security analysts, and web developers. Okay, next slide. And so let's just uh, go over the key takeaways from the program. It's a, a lot of information on, uh, on a lot of different sub-industries. So I know we, we moved quickly, but um, just to sum up on the ICT industry as a whole, real wages have grown 30% since 2011. Um, all industries pay a living wage in LA County. Um, there are different ways that you can calculate that, but um, for, for what that is, but uh, generally, the, the, the wages in the ICT industry are, are above living wage and um, above what you see in the county as a whole. Um, and then also, employment is expected to grow 7% on average uh, across um, all ICT industries, sub-industries through 2028. Okay, and uh, that should do it for me. Um, Thank you for your time and attention. Um, if you have questions, you can reach out to me uh, below at uh, justin.adams at laedc.org. And uh, again, thank you for your time. Thank you, Justin. And with that, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Larry Holt, Vice President of Economic and Workforce Development here at LAEDC. Can't hear you, Larry. Larry, we still can't hear you. Mariana, well, Larry said we can move with the next presenter. Okay, thank you. Uh... I'll go ahead and introduce Luke Meyer, Director of the LA Center of Excellence for Labor Market Research, which is hosted at Mount SAC, Mount San Antonio College. Thanks, Mariana, and uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I will keep this brief so that we can get into discussions with employers and from faculty members uh, regarding programs and trying to align our programs with the needs of industry. So uh, looking at the 19 community colleges in Los Angeles County, each, in, each college has programs in information technology across all of these various disciplines from computer programming, networking, uh, web administration, database design, cybersecurity, cloud computing and Amazon uh, web services, a lot of new data science and data analytics programs, and then a few artificial intelligence and machine learning programs that are uh, combine a lot of skills from uh, various disciplines. And these are just the broad umbrellas of programs, but each college, some are tailored towards um, certifications like, like Microsoft certifications, and some are tailored towards um, other emerging areas as well. Uh, if you look in your lookbook that uh, was just put in the chat, 
uh, there's a list of colleges offering these programs by area on page 23. All right, next slide. So when we look at the students who have earned an award, uh, a degree or certificate in either ICT or digital media at the community colleges, that is how we um, combine our programs into a sector. So our digital media programs are included in this. But if we look over the last 10 years, uh, the number of students who have earned a degree or certificate has more than doubled from 816 in the 2011 academic year to over 1,700 in the most recent academic year that we have data on. So there's been a rise in interest and students completing these programs. Next. All right, and if we look by college, I know that the, those numbers are a little small. You can see the distribution across the 19 colleges and how many students are enrolled. Uh, good news is that I guess 16 out of the 19 colleges enroll 999 students or more. Uh, with the lion's share being at Santa Monica, Mount Sac, Pasadena, and Long Beach, all enrolling over 5,000 students uh, during the most recent academic year. There were 55,901 students uh, across the LA region enrolled in these programs. So very popular. Next. All right. So if we take a look at those students, you can see that just over half are male. So a, a little bit more evenly distributed than the industry data uh, that Justin was showing. Uh, just under half identify as Hispanic. And uh, we have young students, a young, young potential workforce for regional employers here with over half under the age of 24. Um, and young kids in technology, that, that makes sense. So uh, next slide. All right, so these are the completions um, by year, looking at the most recent uh, three academic years. First of all, we can see that the number of awards has increased by about 33% from 1,107 in the 2019-20 uh, academic year to 1,471 in the 21-22 uh, academic year. And then on the right, we calculate the most recent three-year average. So looking at those, you can see computer programming has issued the most, followed by the computer science uh, programs designed for transfer, followed by the general IT programs, and then computer information systems, networking, and computer infrastructure and support. Uh, some of the smaller programs, more niche, are focused on e-commerce uh, and uh, software development. Next slide. All right, if we look at how our students are faring in the labor market. So over the last several years, if you go back to the job with the closely related to field of study slide um, with the blue bars, yeah, thank you. Uh, you can see that just about two thirds of our students end up working in a job that they feel is related to their field of study. Um, ideally, we wanna see that number at 100, but um, that's pretty solid, uh, two out of three students finding uh, work in their, in their field of study. Next. And the median annual earnings for students exiting these programs has risen over the last five years, as you can see, um, up at $31,492. Still beneath the uh, living wage estimate for LA County, which is just over $38,000. So we'd like to see this uh, number increase um, than, than the way that it is. But um, yeah, there's not, I mean, I don't want to say there's nothing we can do about that, but you know, hopefully our employers on the call will have some solutions to this. Next. All right. And the change in earnings. So um, Despite earning a little bit lower than the living wage, you can see our students are increasing their earnings, uh, the highest value being in the 14-15 academic year, increasing their earnings by about a third, all the way up to the most recent years, up by 21%. Next slide. Luke, real quick, it looks like you got a question from Howard. Oh, yeah, yeah, go ahead, Howard. Um, th thank you for this information. I posted it in the chat. Is there a reason why the bars are so out of date? You know, we're in 2023. A lot has happened since 2019. And so I just feel like this is really, really out of date. Um, is there a good reason for that? 
Yeah, that feels like a whole nother world. Uh, that was pre-pandemic times. Uh, so yes, the reason is that that metric is ask. It, it's a survey that goes out to students uh, about 12 to 16 months after they leave their program. And that's called the CTE OS administered by Santa Rosa Junior College. And then from them cleaning the data to um, reporting it and putting it in the launch board where I've accessed this data, there is a lag. Now, if you go directly to Santa Rosa Junior College's website, they have a little bit more up-to-date information, but it's not, the, you can't disaggregate it by individual program area and region and everything that you can with LaunchBoard. So yeah, good point, Howard, thank you. All right, uh, moving along to the students that have earned a living wage, you can see this has increased over the last five years that data is available. Uh, all the way up to just uh, about four out of every 10 students earning a living wage. We'd obviously like to see that at 100. Uh, next slide. And these are the uh, target occupations for all the programs that provide training from software developers being the occupation with the highest level of employment. So the various fields here, 2021 jobs, the number of jobs there were in 2021 in LA County, the uh, you have the change, the percent change uh, over the next five years. All of these are projected to grow at an average rate of a thousand, or excuse me, eleven percent. The number of average annual openings that takes into account the new job growth along with replacement needs. So every time you know someone retires or moves, uh, there's a, a vacancy that needs to be filled. And then you can see the the wages. Uh, the good thing about these occupations is the wages are very strong at the twenty fifth percentile median and 75th percentile. So you can see everything from software developers to web developers, computer programmers, uh, database architects, and database administrators. Next. Uh, looking at job postings for those occupations, you can see over the last year uh, going up to March of this, this, this year, so much more recent, there were uh, just over 93,000 job postings with the lion's share being for software developers, uh, computer occupations, all other, computer user support specialists, and on down the line. Um, so not only is there demand through traditional labor market information, but employers are posting job ads trying to hire these roles um, pretty consistently. Next. This slide shows the uh, most popular job titles from job postings from software engineers all the way down to full stack developers and full stack software engineers. You can see the number of postings associated with each job title. And then on the right, we have the organizations that are hiring these folks. Uh, it's not straight across. So Northrop Grumman is not just hiring software engineers. This is all of their job ads for all of these occupations all the way down. There's a few staffing companies there as well. Um, you see Disney, you see Amazon, Deloitte, uh, several in health as well. Um, yeah, next slide. And then these are those uh, certifications that I briefly mentioned earlier that come from job postings. So uh, a lot of these jobs are seeking security clearances. Um, as you can see from the, the top two, uh, required uh, credentials. And then you have some th via Cisco and some through Microsoft and others. And, and hopefully we can hear from employers uh, uh, which which sort of certifications they're looking for, how important these are compared to um, you know a, a degree or certificate, et cetera. Next. And then the last slide is just showing the wage trend for all these job postings as a whole. So the good takeaway is uh, every single month that we analyze the job postings, the advertised wage were uh, six figures over $100,000, and they've kind of just uh, hovered around the $110,000, $120,000 per year uh, wages. And then at the bottom, you can see the uh, top job postings by city with LA having the lion's share there. All right, so that is some of the uh, supply data related to our programs, and we have many faculty on the call here that can that can talk to their specific programs if need be. But if anybody has questions, there's my contact information, and uh, I'll turn it back over to you, Mariana. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. Um, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Jermaine. 
Thank you, Marianne, and thank you, Luke, and thank you, Justin, from our IAE team as well. Um, so once again, I mean, I think we heard some great uh, information. So the next portion of this program advisory is the roundtable discussion. So um, please just make sure you're muted, just a few things. Uh, submit, submit questions through the chat. Obviously, you can just raise your hand as well. I actually want to make sure that there's dialogue. So please just don't sit and uh, be quiet. If you, if you have questions, if there's things that you want um, to, to uh, kind of maybe state an opinion on and things of that nature, please just come off mute or raise your hand um, and please move forward with that. Um, each topic we're going to kind of go over, we may bounce around a little bit depending on how things go. Um, and then we'll do some uh, Q&A as well. And so right now, if I could, I know we had one employer that was run, partner that was running late, but um, Linda from Microsoft, if you could come on, I see you there. Welcome, Linda. Thank you so much as always. Uh, Sydney, I see you on from Google. We have Justin from Apple, and then we have Anika from LA Metro. If you could also uh, come on video as well, that would be great. And we will begin getting into the discussion. And so a few different things that I really kind of took away from the data and the research. And so just so everyone's clear with at LADC, what we primarily do is we inform the community and engage the community through research and data. Um, everything that we do, we want to make sure that it's validated by that, right? So when we're talking about equitable pathways into various sectors, um, high growth sectors or in-demand sectors, um, like ICT is, is considered in demand, not necessarily a growth sector um, anymore. Um, a growth sector would be more so a bioscience or ocean economy, right? We want to make sure we validate any information that we're putting out into the public with, with data and analytics, right? And so that's what we just heard. And a few takeaways that I have, the lion's share of the opportunities are millennials and Gen Zers, right? Ages under 40. And so that's huge to think about because the whole purpose of this program advisory is to really see how the community colleges can leverage the programs and the certificates that they are providing um, and essentially get their upwards of 500,000 students um, into opportunities. And so um, obviously there is a variety of folks that are taking programs across the 19 colleges um, in ICT pathways. So there's a tremendous opportunity here um, for individuals to go into opportunities. Um, it looks like the the uh, the uh, sector is going to grow 7.3 percent. That's a big takeaway. So there are going to be jobs available. That's huge. That's something that we want to talk about. I also saw that it's a male dominated industry. It's one thing to see it's a male dominated industry nationwide, but it's another thing and a little bit even more concerning when you see that it's still male dominated, even here in L.A. County. And so that's another opportunity because we want to make sure it's equitable. Um, not just from a race and ethnicity standpoint, but also from a gender standpoint as well, right? So we want to make sure that we have more opportunities for women and then also those that identify as LGBTQ as well, because that population is also much lower as it pertains to um, demographics as well. Another piece to kind of think about in general is race and ethnicity. Minorities as a whole are underrepresented in ICT uh, career opportunities. And so that's another opportunity that I'm 100% positive the community colleges can immediately address. And I'm bringing these topics up for our employer partners because the colleges not only have the programs, but they have plenty of uh, students that fit all of these different challenges and, and gaps that we see. And it would be great to see these individuals go into these opportunities. The other piece is that I, that I hear, and I always bring this up, is LA County is expensive. It's expensive to live here and we want folks to thrive. We want people to be able to get an education, whether it's a two-year degree, four-year degree, or even just a six-month certificate. Whatever it is, we want folks to be able to flourish. The one thing about ICT pathways and careers in, in particular that um, we just heard is that they pay a living wage. Even the entry-level positions pay a living wage. Living wage here, for those that don't know, is $21.22 an hour. And that's for a single individual with no dependents. So that number obviously increases exponentially as you add dependence to a household. But nonetheless, the bottom line is tremendous opportunities, tremendous things that we can discuss. And so with that being said, um, for my employer partners that um, are on the call, the first question um, that we really want to dive into is really surrounding industry and workforce trends. What are some of what are the top emerging trends in ICT pathways that the community colleges should know about? 
And I'll start with Sydney, um, only because you're right there and I see you first, and then we'll move to Anika and then Linda. And then I know, I think we're still waiting on our representative from Apple. So Cindy. Hi. I'm, um, I'm here. Uh, sorry, I didn't need to Oh, Justin, that. thank you. Oh, hey, sorry, Justin. Sydney. Hey, I keep hey, hey, oh, hey. Oh, that's okay. Join a little bit late, oh, but I'm here now. Thank so. you, Justin, for joining. So I'll go Sydney, and then we'll go to Anika, and then Linda, and then Justin. Thank you. Great, and I'm sorry, that was so exciting that I forgot the question. Re tell me again what the question is. What do you want we're, me to say? We're with? talking right now about industry and workforce trends. So what are some Great. of the top emerging trends in ICT pathways for community colleges and what they should know? That you can Great, share? and I just wanted to first say that I'm so privileged to be here and I'm also planning on learning a lot. And the, the first couple of presentations were really, really helpful in kind of grounding ourselves in the data and the statistics, which is, is great for me. So happy to be here and be a thought partner um, and definitely make it a dialogue. So I'll watch the chat as much as I can. Um, I, I am not an economist and very happy that we have Justin here. Um, and I thought that, that was a great, uh, you know, thing to run through to kind of, again, ground ourselves. I think it's really hard to forecast right now and project what um, jobs are going to look like. And I, I just want to call out for everyone here, like we are living through extraordinary times. Um, and I know we keep feeling that, feel a little bit like a car commercial, but it's happening. Um, and it's it's tough to draw parallels, I think, to other economic times because it it's more than that. You know, there's a lot of political unrest. It's a post-pandemic landscape in education, which where education was affected, I think, primarily. Um, so there's a, a lot happening. And so first, I just want to say that for everyone who is working in community colleges, you're, you're doing a lot um, and you're working with students who have lived through a lot. Um, and we can't kind of overstate that. And I think treat this as like business as usual. Um, with that said, it's also extremely difficult to project what's going to happen with jobs because generative AI in the last three months has exploded onto the scene. And it's, it's so tricky and exciting and challenging to figure out where that's going next. Um, so I'm sure all of us will have something to say about that. But I, I saw that, you know, community colleges are offering um, programs in security, programs in cloud computing, programs in data analytics, and programs in AI and machine learning. That all seems right on the money to me as far as preparing students. So I can stop there. I know we have lots of time together and allow my, my esteemed colleagues to also weigh in. Um, and we can get in, I think, to the thick of that a little bit more as we keep talking. Absolutely, Anika. Good morning, everyone. Again, thank you for uh, the invitation to be here. Um, I wanted to call out, um, of, of course, uh, my area which is GIS uh, and geospatial intelligence. That's an area that um, it, it seems as though there's, there's still not an understanding that that is an area that is, I mean, growing in leaps and bounds, uh, not just in terms of the technology, but in terms of the application. Um, uh, the whole concept of where things happen and the analysis that goes along with that and the optimization that can result as a, as you know, um, after having done that analysis, that is something that um, post, particularly post pandemic, every industry needs. Every industry needs to know how to do more with less. It's a min max problem, right? Uh, and that is where GIS and the applicable technologies that, you know, that feed into GIS. I mean, from AI to BIM to, you know, I mean, pretty much every part of, of, um, of the, the new wave um, IT, uh, in addition to the legacy uh, IT uh, fields of, you know, network, networking technology, um, uh, understanding infrastructure, data, et cetera, it, GIS neatly ties in all of those areas. And there's a, it is a very niche area, uh, but it is, a, it is definitely one of those areas that's, uh, that is, I would say, excluding. Um, right now, I'm actually at um, taking some time from the CIO conference at Esri here in Redlands uh, to talk to you guys um, uh, about this. And this is exactly what we're talking about. The fact that this thing has taken off. And I mean, literally everybody from Starbucks to Capital One to, you know, LA Metro, you know, public and private 
uh, are seeing much great, a much greater need to take a more critical look, a more, um, a more sophisticated critical look at their data and their analytics and the way in which they do business. So that's what um, I would want uh, to share in particular about um, the industry and where the industry is experiencing growth. Thank you, Nick. And I'll circle back later because with all the work that LA Metro is doing um, in terms of infrastructure, it'll be good to know uh, how some of these pathways can align with opportunities. Thank you, though. Um, Linda, yeah. emerging trends from Microsoft. Uh, Let's hear it. <laughs> well, just uh, thanks, uh, Jermaine and LADC for hosting this and to Lark, um, always a great partner in all of this. So good to see everyone. I think some of the um, emerging trends in terms of preparing the workforce, one of them is really revisiting the idea of um, creating a pipeline. So we're looking at really a K through 16, at least, um, starting from that. And to what the comment that John is making about, you know, the Department of Energy putting out a request for wanting, you know, more folks involved, um, it just doesn't start at a singular point in time. So it's by, you know, putting it out there for someone who's in college or considering college, it really starts at a much younger age. We know that research shows that when students are exposed to certain types of thinking and critical thinking, whether it's just the basic concept of let's say coding, there is a way that it affects their trajectory and how and in what field they go into and how they think about um, science and filling some of these um, tech um, industry gaps. So I think that's one of the things that we're looking at again. Um, I know the state of California has put out funding to um, support this scope of work, as well as the US Department of Education and how they're saying, how do we reimagine career pathways? So they're also having a focus on that, so the discussion around, okay, so what are some emerging trends? Another one is looking at alternatives to learning. So talking about the upcoming workforce and that generation is looking at, it's not as traditional as it used to be, including the fact that people go into um, a workforce, they don't stay there for retirement anymore. And that's our, that's been an ongoing conversation. So how do we adapt to that? And a part of that is looking at um, qualifications on that they may not have that four year, but programs and even some corporate um, partners, including uh, Microsoft has done this, is that the it's about um, skills skills first learning. So people taking initiative to whether they're going through a two year program, a certification program, taking boot camps, taking courses online to enhance their learning in order to then go into a, whether an internship program, an apprenticeship, or even a um, applying for some competitive um, job postings that will not require those four-year degrees. And this will be my last one. And I think this is something more um, about on the concept of ongoing learning because of the very fast moving nature of technology. And as Sydney mentioned about AI, and as we're thinking about cybersecurity and just how jobs are constantly changing and, um, but workers are adapting to that. So how are we supporting them in their adapt of it and the opportunity there is for community colleges is not just considering the skilling component that it's just a means to an end but it's a means to an ongoing process of learning for professional development by by reskilling and upskilling the workforce so with all of that being said there are um, courses that we would say through um, uh, LinkedIn learning that is provided for some of those certifications, but there are also um, industry-wide certifications that uh, folks may need to have, whether they're going to become a software engineer, go into IT, cybersecurity, very specific um, platforms, cloud computing that are used by specific companies that are also a part of what is in the um, Microsoft Learn or MS Learn content or portfolio that actually can be subsidized or free depending on the partnerships that we build out with different nonprofits and colleges that it'll help them prepare for those certifications. So just wanted to share some of those topics. 
Absolutely. Thank you, Linda. Great bringing up the cloud computing piece. I know uh, LEDC in partnership with uh, the community college has been doing this work for a long time. And I know Sac Santa Monica College actually um, spearheaded a lot of that work in the cloud computing uh, curriculum uh, area. Um, so very grateful for that. And we have tons of programs now um, that reflect uh, certificates in that area as well. Um, the other piece that I want to uplift um, before I go to you, Justin, Luke here in the chat um, speaking to a point that Anika made um, is that in terms of colleges that offer degrees and certificates in GIS, um, LA Pierce, Mount San Antonio, um, Pasadena City, Rio Hondo, and Santa Monica. So um, that being said, you know, for our employer partners and more specific, we have college talent that is, 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 is trained and ready, I think, for the workforce. And I think we just need to do um, a, a better job, in fact, or even just, you know, kind of influence it more um, in getting these individuals into these opportunities. Um, so moving forward to Justin, emerging trends, anything to share from Apple? <laughs> yeah, I, I'll speak I'll speak generally from my point of view and then maybe a little bit from, from Apple's side. Uh, again, I want to thank um the, the entire team for having me here I'm, I'm happy to build with you all and connect with you all and and learn as well as contribute uh just from my limited knowledge of you know the industry and my experiences uh but I'll start off by saying what Sydney said is just hit the nail on hit the, the hammer right on the nail um in that so much has changed in the past three years like there needs to be a tremendous amount of grace given to you all and the work that you're doing um, and the work that we're trying to do and understanding that uh, <laughs> what we say today could change next month. <laughs> Maybe not next month, but uh, very, very soon. Um, and I think uh, adaptability is probably the chief skill and trend, you know, that I would champion, you know, and, and in, in all of this, you know, in, in domains and technologies and frameworks and protocols, you know, adaptability being like, you know, the the chief skill, you know, that I would champion and, and openness to, to, to learn. You know, I, I have so many times over the past couple of months where I've just felt like, man, like I just I have no idea what's going on. You know, I'm trying to keep up myself like I'm trying to work, you know, and I'm trying to keep up with just what's going on in the world. Not let alone, you know, tragedies, you know, and mass shootings and, and politics, right? And, you know, on the left side, we have AI and GPT, you know, going at a rapid pace. I'm um, really trying to like grasp on and, and you know, by the coattails of just this entire thing. Uh, but say all that to say, I think Sydney hit it right on there, like a tremendous amount of grace in understanding that things are just changing and we may not have all the answers, you know, um, and that's totally fine. You know, we're trying, and what we're doing right now is, is trying to get a hold of things. Uh, and I think that that is a noble effort in and of itself. Um, so with that, some of the trends, uh, with, with AI and ML, because it's really hot right now. Um, I, I think that, uh, first in understanding what GPT is and, you know, uh, a neural network and a, a language learning model. Um, and what we've seen on the rise, I think from the consumer standpoint is the interaction with things like chat GPT and things like uh, mid journey for generative art, right? Um, these tools I think are very, very cool because I think it's the first time where like a new technology has come into play and then the consumer kind of gets a hold of like, oh, this is how I can interact with this thing versus like, cryptocurrency and the blockchain and the blockchain and people are still just like okay what is it or like nfts and people are like okay what exact how can i what's the real world you know um but these other kind of tools and other kind of use cases that we're seeing and you know i i could probably share some resources on you know newsletters and i'm following that just kind of build on the different tools that are being built on top of gpt or taking advantage of chat gpt um, I think having a knowledge of what uh, what is going on from that standpoint and also understanding from the chat GPT standpoint, you know, I've seen companies now putting listings uh, up and hiring for prompt engineers. So people that just are skilled at knowing how to prompt this model to 
get the response and get, you know, um, a product back, you know, and, and in a way that they they need to be or they, they need to, the way they see fit. Um, we also saw, at least from the, the Apple connection, not anything that we're doing specifically, if we were doing something specifically, I wouldn't be able to talk about it. Uh, but we saw the first uh, Swift app submitted to the App Store built solely from chat GPT, right? Um, and I think that GPT as a, as a, a larger um, model and AI is, is one thing, but I would say from maybe at the community college standpoint, you know, digging into exploring, just interacting with either chat GPT itself or tools that are taking advantage of chat GPT to enhance their workflow. I think Steve Jobs talked a lot about, um, I think when he introduced, I think the iPod or the iPad, he introduced this notion to the press about what Apple is trying to do with creating uh, a bicycle for the mind. And that's how I view uh, GPT and chat GPT and AI and recent AI and ML tools is that, hey, like this is a tool to enhance your workflow and make you more efficient. You know, the creativity is there. You know, we just want to get you the, the things to, you know, 10x or 100x that, right? Um, and on one hand, you know, I'm concerned about, okay, what things are, is the industry going to try to do to push a sort of automating real people out of jobs, right? But on the other hand, it's like, okay, well, how can I use this to enhance what I'm doing to maybe strip away some of the mundane aspects of my day-to-day -day and, uh, you know, use this as a way to, okay, I can use my creativity elsewhere because this tool can, you know, get this work done for me and, and, and so on and so forth. So um, AI and ML for sure, I think is a really, really hot topic and in, in understanding GPT and chat GPT and tools that take advantage of this um, is, is super emerging right now. And, and it would behoove us to all understand that and, and push that and push an understanding for that. Um, secondly, I would say digital health and tele telehealth. Uh, we've seen with the rise of the pandemic, right? Um, not only people, unfortunately, you know, dying and passing away and being underserved, you know, by not having the tools, you know, physically and, and digitally to, or whether it be access to healthcare or even just knowledge, you know, about what to do in certain things. I think I've seen a rise in uh, telehealth and that giving people uh, services where, you know, if you don't want to go physically into an office, you can talk to or chat with, you know, medical experts you know, based off of symptoms you're facing or any questions you have greater or great or small, you know, with anything um, from a healthcare standpoint, I think the, 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 uh, the faults and the failures of our healthcare system uh, at large uh, nationwide and even worldwide in some cases have been pronounced with the pandemic that I don't think are going away anytime soon. Um, so digital health and telehealth uh, you know, is I think is another portion or another piece of, of emerging technology that I think is very beneficial um, to start and, and learn from and to take advantage of for sure. Um, next thing I'll mention is I'm talking a lot. Um, I think every, what everyone said before was right on the money again, uh, but computer vision. And I think that that is a little bit different from uh, AR, VR is maybe a cousin to some of the stuff that we're seeing in, in, in augmented reality and virtual reality. But what I mean by computer vision is, is you know, uh, technology that um, supports um, teaching computers meaningful or computers deriving meaningful uh, information based off of visual input, right? And um, that's everywhere from any kind of, you know, facial recognition technology to, uh, you know, self-driving cars, you know, and and cameras, and and you see us, you know, going in that direction, um, with you know Teslas and a lot of EVs kind of moving in that direction too. Um, I think that's something that's emerging that's going to be beneficial, whether it be in automotive, whether it be in you know, um, uh, you know, biometrics or or, or user user um, authentication, you know, from a visual standpoint. Um, that's also something that I think uh, is. Is emerging and still we're still in the, the the elementary phases I would say too in a lot of ways but uh, yeah AI ML uh, digital health and telehealth and computer vision uh, for sure. Thank you, all great points. John Craig has a question in the chat. John, I don't know. Did you want to come off and elaborate a little bit because I'm not even going to pretend to know what GitHub portfolio is. 
Um, so John, did you want to come off mute? If not, I'll just read the question. Um, do employers- I, I have a question, yeah. I'm happy to answer it too. Oh, okay, yeah. Do employers ever ask or look at students' GitHub portfolio? What can uh, essentially colleges do to help students polish that? What would you look for? So, Sydney, yeah. please go Sorry for it. Sorry to be eager. Um, these are great questions, and I love the back and forth. And Justin, thank you for breaking the ice and saying that like we don't have all the answers, and we are. I think all of us here are so happy to just like partner with all of you to come up with the answers. Um, so yeah, we all have a lot of expertise on this call. Um, okay, so for the GitHub um, portfolio, yes, absolutely. Um, we ask students to because most resume sharing now is online, we ask students to just hyperlink their GitHub. And most of our recruiters will spend time, depending on the job opening, they'll go in and look through um, your portfolio. So I think that's a really great way um, without taking up much space that you can showcase some of the project work that you've done. Um, I love to see, I'm, and I'm speaking as a former recruiter at Google. So I was a recruiter for five years for new grads. It's how I started my career. Um, I love to see just sort of at the undergraduate level or at the community college level, like a wide breadth of projects with like a beginning, middle and end that utilize um, object oriented programming languages. Um, and just show me also, you know, project work, I think is one of the things that we can look at on a resume that actually show some passion. So I've seen uh, all sorts of project work um, from, a, you know, a student who um, did like the coding of iambic pentameter on Shakespeare to, you know, things that are a little bit more tech centric, but like it shows me a little bit more about a student, which I think can be really helpful. Um, if you don't want to link a GitHub, students can feel free to just actually have a category on their resume that's project work. And again, I would choose like two to three projects that utilize object oriented programming language and just kind of tell me like, what does the, the thing you made do? Um, and this can be like an app too. Um, and what technologies did it utilize? And that just shows me like this person has some proficiency in doing this because it was able to make a project or an app that did this. So I love to see that on resumes. And I think that that was a great call out. Yeah, uh, thank you, Sydney. Uh, thank you, John, for the question. Please go ahead, Linda. You want to add? Yeah, I just wanted to add to what Sydney's saying. Um, we may not ask for it explicitly as a requirement in um, the application, but there is a field to include it. And in addition to that, there are um, opportunities for hiring like them, let's say I'll use Microsoft's program. I think other companies have it too, but the LEAP program is once again, going back to that idea of a non-traditional like path of how did you train yourself? How did you learn to build that skill set to get into this field of engineering? So that's an opportunity to showcase um, that portfolio. And in our working with nonprofit organizations in terms of not in terms of their skilling um, individuals for roles, but also in terms of helping them prepare for the interviews and job placements, they do help them and support them in getting that portfolio ready and be able to address it or reference it in their interviews. And oftentimes our participants have given feedback that it has been a differentiator in um, their interviews and how the portfolio does help. So we get feedback both from the employer as well as those who are going out, um, candidates for interviews as well as to what the impact has been. Absolutely. Thank you, Linda. Um, and I know John is from Long Beach City College, if I'm not mistaken. And so with that question on GitHub, and so definitely want to highlight that because our other uh, faculty across the other 18 colleges, are you all leveraging GitHub as well? Because it sounds like it's, it, it's something that could be beneficial in the hiring process. So just, you know, kind of give me a one or two, one for yes and two for no in the chat. Um, you don't have to all come off, but just want to kind of highlight that to see if other colleges are using GitHub. Um, I was not aware of that as well. Another question I want to bring up since we started getting into technology, AI, and equipment, um, 
And I'll start with Anika on this because I think you brought up some really good points in regards to GIS. So starting with Anika, what software programs and equipment should community colleges be implementing in their curriculum to ensure their graduates are work ready? So um, I can, sorry, I have some notifications coming in there. Um, so I can speak, you know, specifically to GIS, because again, that's my, you know, sphere of influence. Um, so um, Esri software uh, is pretty much the Microsoft of, of GIS. It, it is the de facto, and, and in many cases, the jury um, uh, platform uh, that is used uh, right now. And it's a platform that is most mature uh, in terms of what it can do in terms of, you know, not just uh, integrating um, hardware and software, but also accommodating different areas of um, different disciplines. So for example, at Metro, Metro does everything from uh, planning um, and financing all the way through construction, architecture, uh, operations, maintenance, so it, does, it runs the entire gamut, and G, our GIS system is we use we use our GIS primarily, and it is able to speak to and support all of those, including marketing. We use GIS uh, as as what we um, as the core software for our base maps. So um, a clear understanding of how the ArcGIS platform works, um, not just the software um, ArcPro. Um, uh, uh, and how the enterprise works, but also just the, the structure, the infrastructure as well, understanding ArcGIS Online, understanding um, you know, how ArcGIS Online relates to ArcPro and to the enterprise platform. The other thing that uh, I have been encouraging uh, my staff, again, this is something that's still very new for Metro, um, but you know, again, elsewhere, it's, it's you know, very much alive and well, is Python programming, Python and also ArcPy. If students can hone their skills um, uh, in Python and ArcPy, um, but particularly Python, it would make them, it would set them head and shoulders uh, above uh, their competing uh, applicants if they had that, uh, that background. Uh, um, in terms of other software, there's not a whole lot of other software that I would you know, necessarily call out. But like I said, those are the core ones, um, that understanding of, of how to use ArcPro, um, understanding ArcGIS Online, and then uh, Python. Those are, you know, would be my main ones. Absolutely. Thank you, Anika. Uh, I'll go to Justin mm -hmm. and then Linda or uh, Sydney, if you would like to also um, elaborate on this question as well, that would be great. Yeah, uh, so I mean, I, I'm going to come at it from the the software side and if software is a part of the curriculum. Um, I know I can speak more specifically to, you know, Apple's Apple's developer suite, um, which includes Xcode, uh, which is a um, an IDE, uh, a developer developer tool used to uh, write code, basically text editor, compiler. Um, it's what, you know any dev um, building something for the app store, a mobile, um, but not just for mobile, but probably the most common case now is probably using. Um, uh, if, you know, developing an Objective-C or Swift UI um, is a thing that's a part of, you know, the development or software development curriculum, uh, for sure, you can take advantage of Xcode. Um, I don't know of, of uh, guys, correct me if I'm wrong. Microsoft still use Visual Studio, uh, or I, I don't know what the what the the counterpart is uh, on the Microsoft side today <laughs> since my college days. But um, yeah, that's from the developer standpoint. I mean, I think that um, from the equipment standpoint too. Um, I'm assuming you know that uh, relatively up to date, you know. MacBooks, PCs, Chromebooks, you know, um, from a hardware and equipment standpoint, uh, I think is crucial, right? Um, and also having on hand, you know, some mobile devices, some iPhones, some iPads, some Android mobile devices, uh, some tablets. Uh, yeah, I think that, you know, especially if you're talking about doing development and mobile development, if, you know, you, you're teaching a class on that, wanting to have the ability to have a student 
go from, all right, I'm going from building this in this standpoint and I don't have to use a simulator, but I can also, you know, compile and load this app on this device, I think really creates like the, the well-rounded experience. So for any development class, uh, those tools, software and hardware, uh, being able to um, have those things, you know, machines, laptops, computers, equipments, mobile devices, and on the software side, I think will help kind of paint that complete picture. Um, yeah, that's what I'll speak to just from the, I guess, from the development side. Absolutely. Thank you. Linda or Sydney, did you want to add to this one? Linda, I'll defer to you and then I'm happy to play cleanup. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I have, I have too much to add to in terms of like specific software, but going back to just the idea of looking at how software is evolving and how it's being applied in the workplace, especially because of AI, it's being able to be reskilled in those things to understand how those technology is working and um, impacting the workforce. And back to Justin's point earlier of how it contributes then to that efficiency, because a big intention of some of these things that are embedded in like, let's say Microsoft 365, and I'm sure there are others out there, it's not necessarily, as we say, like intended to replace people. It's just how do we transform and facilitate um, some of that work? So just wanted to put that thought out there about how, you know, thinking about software um, in particular and how it's used in the workplace, but what could, what's a practical application or things that we can do as we talk about um, skilling the workforce or preparing them for it. Thank you, Linda. Sydney, did you want to add? Yeah, I will add a little bit, I think, and take us potentially in a new direction. I would say I just saw Jermaine, wait, Jermaine, you are killing it on the chat and the moderating, but I love what you just dropped into. I the, the languages, absolutely. I mean, I expect like students in general now, regardless of what they're studying, should be fairly proficient at like Excel, G Suite, things like that. And I think we just see that anyway, because of definitely how they were educated during the pandemic um, and, and just other classes. So that's usually not a concern for the languages. Totally agree with the list that you put here, Jermaine, uh, starting with HTML and CSS. I mentioned object-oriented programming languages. We would want to see like a Java, Python, agree. I, we don't have a strong preference between Java and Python. We have products that deal with both. Um, C++, maybe a little bit be below those now, but Java or Python for sure. So we'd want a student to start gain some proficiency in, in a single language like Java or Python. And then as they get a little bit more proficient, they can start adding on languages. Um, and you're able to note that in, on your resume, you can say what you're more proficient in. You can either you know make a, a note of what you're more proficient in as a student, or you can list them and recruiters read your proficiency in order from left to right. Um, so that's, that's it on the languages. Um, I would also just bring up a point um, about how students are learning. So um, I would like to leverage classroom experience that emulates the workplace whenever possible. Um, so students engaging with available open data sets for projects, which you can find many of, um, but just students having the ability to really deal with like large amounts of data. Um, this is great for project-based learning or having students learn you know, in a group. Um, and that's something that they, they will do on the job. So I think really good to get in front of and then whenever um, community colleges can be engaging in project-based learning, I know that, that sometimes it's a little bit of a, a tall order to ask for, especially with large class sizes, but when you know students are able to do project-based work, I do feel like that's a lot more in line with what we're looking for on the job. Um, so that was kind of the only thing I wanted to call out. And then we do love to see students pair programming um, because that way they're really talking about everything that they're doing, which is what they're gonna have to do in the interview, which can feel when you're interviewing really counterintuitive to just say everything in your thought process and what you're doing in your code. So the earlier we can get students doing that, the better. Um, and just adding on to what Linda said, I think that AI brings about some really exciting advancements in how students are going to be learning. And so one thing is in, in, you know, in the next year or the next couple of years, probably a lot of that pair programming and checking in code is, is going to be done through AI. So there's tools that I think are going to take on some of the teaching of this and, and hopefully make it um, a little bit of a lighter lift. 
Thank you, Sydney. Appreciate those comments. Anika, it looks like you put some in the chat. I'll, I'll let you go ahead and, and speak to it real quick. Oh, yeah, sure. No problem. So, yeah, I was just um, making a note on uh, on GIS specifically for those of you that have uh, the GIS programs uh, at your uh, institutions. Um, as you know, GIS um, has, you know, grown leaps and bounds from what it used to be. Used to, when it was ARC Info, it was strictly programming. I mean, you had to know how to program in order to use, you know, uh, ARC Info. Now it's a, it's very application based. So there's, you know, survey one, two, three, um, there's dashboards, there's velocity, there's a bunch of different applications that sit on the uh, GIS platform now that what we are looking for is your ability to use those. So. Python is, you know, very valuable. I'm not gonna, you know, I don't wanna take away from that, but um, we also wanna see that you're actually able to use uh, survey one, two, three, you know, um, use this, uh, do a mashup of, of um, applications, basically use a, use a set of applications to complete a project. That's more what I am looking for as an employer. I wanna see that I give you a project that you understand what, the, you know, you can kind of, you know, critically look at it and say, okay, this stage needs this application, this stage needs this application. I can make these two applications work together to get this desired result. That's more of what, you know, um, especially in the GIS world, that's more of what we're uh, looking for. Um, and I really want to speak to, I think it was Sydney uh, that was just speaking, um, that whole uh, concept of project-based learning, um, that is really critically important for us. That's something that I, I know I look for on, on, applica on applications because I want to see where those skills are transferable. You may not necessarily have had job experience, but if you if you had a project that allows you to kind of think through step by step, critically how to execute um, and address a problem, that's what you know. That's what I would say. Okay, this student is ready to work in the you know. I can give this student a data set, and they can take that knowledge that previous knowledge or experience and apply it to you know a work-based um, um problem so that's you know um i just wanted to mention those two things um for you guys to talk about i mean for you to kind of take back to the classrooms and ensure that your students are learning excellent thank you all excellent comments um real quick in milan i hope i'm saying your name accurately did you want to come off mute and kind of elaborate it looked like you put a couple things in the chat um, did you want to come off mute and elaborate a little bit on some of your questions? Sure. Uh, my main interest in joining this regional advisory was to partner with uh, some industry for Mission College and actually get implement the project-based learning to have somewhere where my students can get some guidance from the industry. Hey, can you build this for us? And then they come and critique the work because we are teaching a lot of courses as I'm listed also. I've been viewing what the industry wants. I look at the jobs and I created certificates to make sure that they have the skill sets. But just having the skill sets and textbook information is not going to get them the job. So I would like them to interact with the industry. And so I'm at the now once my students are reaching the capstone project, where do they go next? I want to build those bonds and have that kind of uh, relationships develop. So I would really like it if you could contact me and uh, say that, yes, we'll be coming and we can help you or not in person, just that even online, that this is what you can do. I'll put my email address on the, that and uh, I'll be very, very, that's my main focus is now I have worked enough for last two, three years to create the programs and to get the right skill sets available for the students. But I would like to tell my students, come here, meet this person. This is what they'll do. This is a project that we have, the capstone project that you'll work on, which will can be on your GitHub, not your textbook exercises that you do, because that's all I see on the GitHub from the students is they put the final project of the classes, but they are still textbook examples. They're still not something that they have creatively thought about, that this is how I will write this solution and it will solve this problem of my community. They still need that extra synergy or understanding or kind of uh, inspirational or kind of, you know, motivation to take them 
to build those other skill sets that they need to have in a job. Absolutely. I would go for it. Any if I could just you know jump in, I would be more than happy. I think that you know to to be quite truthful, I don't think that we. I could speak for the public sector, um, or maybe I should just speak for Metro. I don't know, but I feel as though um, we can do a better job of reaching out uh, and and having those you know much closer uh, connections. Because we do have connections, but I think that there's there's opportunity to do more. There's opportunity for us to do more and reach out and say, hey. You know, this is what we're dealing with, you know, at the office. This, these are the types of challenges. These are the types of problem sets. These are the, 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 the skill sets that we are looking for. Um, I think we can be a lot clearer. So I'd be more than happy uh, to reach out and share some of those um, projects, you know, the types of projects that, you know, I work on, uh, the types of, you know, uh, uh, things that I have to solve for um, my different business units. Uh, I think it would be helpful, you know, to share that so that you can see kind of where the rubber meets the road uh, from theory to practical. Because I do, I do believe that there's a sometimes a big jump uh, from theory to practical in that we have these students that are well versed. Um, I mean, I've experienced it with one of my own staffers. He was well versed in in GIS, and I mean, could you know analyze, you know, uh, you know, to the to the tooth and nail, but he, in terms of the application, he struggled with that. And so I had to work with him to kind of share and, you know, give the example and, and, and mentor. But if they're coming in with a lot of that early on, that helps us out a lot. Thank you. I will definitely keep in touch with you. Uh, and and uh, actually you have my email. So if I can get yours, I will, we'll do something before the semester ends. I mean, that's how eager I am to bring something for my students to my college. And I can also connect you both. Um, so Anika and uh, Professor Milan, I'll go ahead and make the connection as well via email. Thank you. And Excellent. with Sydney as well. Looks like Sydney put some information in there as well. Linda, did you want to, uh, did you have another comment or Justin? I yeah. see you guys both came on. I have a comment. It's more of something that I saw recently um, online, just looking at different videos and how I, because it's still so new, it's this is not definitely say do it. It's not research based, but even seeing um, it in ch chat GPT, there have been um, scenarios that get put in there for some of these um, uh, learning opportunities. Let's say if there's a topic that's covered in the classroom, and then chat GPT actually gave individuals feedback um, on the spot in the moment on how, you know, what was it that are they going on the right path? What can be modified? So I wonder, and this is more of just thinking out loud as we're talking about AI, is that a way in which um, technology and AI can be leveraged to enhance these learning experiences? Because then embedded in there and just watching this video it was very interesting. It talks about adaptive learning as well. So getting to that point of understanding where um, someone's skill set is, and then it provides it, instructors um, feedback on where their um, students and learners are in order to modify that learning experience as they're going through the training. But I'd say this is just something that I came across. Just it was just very um, interesting, just the concept and how it's being um, integrated into um, the the learning. Justin, I didn't know if you wanted to add something too. Oh, you no, no, no. Me early. no, we, we, we yeah, uh, everybody else hit it. I'm, I'm good for now. <laughs> Perfect. And so we'll, we, with the last, I mean, we're, we're supposed to be in, ending at one. I want to, you know, kind of pass it over to my colleague, Jose Palayo here for a couple, you know, kind of talent um, driven questions and skills gap questions, workforce talent pipeline. Uh, development questions. But before I do so, one thing I kind of want to uplift and maybe even ask of our faculty that are here on the call today, um, and I and I kind of hinted at with Anika, we're working with, you know, LA Metro in many different in aspects. And so one of the biggest things is the infrastructure um, investments that are coming into our city. Um, most folks know at this point that we have FIFA World Cup that is coming in 2026. We have 2028, we have the, the US Olympic, I mean, the uh, World Olympics that's coming as well. Major opportunities. Um, and when it comes to ICT pathways, it's not just about learning how to code and learning the basics and getting into an entry level position. 
most folks in these pathways, and this the same thing applies to things like graphic design, et cetera, is entrepreneurship, right? And I just wonder how much our faculty, and I'm actually asking as a question, are we influencing entrepreneurship in our classrooms? And then the other component to that is how to answer procurement opportunities. How does one make themselves an applicable business so that they can apply to procurement opportunities? Because there's gonna be a plethora of them with the infrastructure dollars that are coming and all of the opportunities that are gonna be here happening here in LA. So any of our faculty, could you come off me real quick while we have our industry partners on as well and just maybe talk a little bit about some of the soft skills training that you're doing around um, entrepreneurship and things like that, if, if any at all. Any faculty on here that want to kind of speak to that? Well, once going twice. Well, we have nothing in particular for ICT industry, but in our college, we have STEM week and STEM day where we invite people and we have a lot of vocational kind of uh, industry uh, on site who are ready to willing to hire a career day. And so those kind of opportunities that when we invite industry folks to come and speak about and what they say is that, okay, you should have project management scale, GitHub and things like that. They tell the students as to what is expected from them. Absolutely. But nothing Thank in particular. Absolutely. Thank you. Wanted to ask that question because that's something that I know is, is becoming more and more of a piece um, when actually connecting with students, is that a lot of students don't necessarily want to go work for someone, per se. Um, and some may want to work for someone, but need to supplement that income with something. I myself, I work at LADC. However, I myself am an entrepreneur. Um, I know how to go out and get procurement opportunities. And so um, myself as a millennial, um, I think that that is something that we should definitely be also teaching to supplement a lot of the work, the great work that you all are doing. And just wanted to uplift that because that's come from multiple students, not only that I mentor, but just students in general through the work that we've been doing through these uh, work-based learning opportunities that we provide that most of the time follow these program advisories directly with students. And then I've had several, um, like in the graphic design field, for, for, for instance, a lot of those individuals and in just in the digital media entertainment world, because ICT aligns with that as well, you see a lot of gig work. And so when you're operating in, a, in, in fields that there's a lot of gig work or contractual work, um, our students need to be prepared to be able to conduct themselves in a certain fashion so that they are able to go after these opportunities um, and supplement their income. And so with that being said, I want to go ahead and pass it over to my colleague, Jose Palayo, to kind of close us out on a few additional questions. And then maybe we can take some questions for our panelists from uh, the faculty across the 19 that are on the call as well. Thank you. Thank you, Jermaine. Uh, first and foremost, thank you to our employer partners and all the audience for such a great conversation. As Jermaine mentioned, I'm going to address a few topics that are very vital and regarding some skills gaps and preparing for the future. Uh, with that being said, the first question, uh, do you have an upskill need for your current workforce that the community college could provide? And I'd like to go with Sydney first and then Anika and Justin. Uh, Linda did step out, she informed me, so she'll be back shortly. But again, uh, I'd like to start with Sydney. Sure. Um, so let me make sure I understand the question. Like, am I noticing a, like a void in learning that I think that community colleges could uniquely feel, Phil? Yeah, so do you see any uh, a need for an upskill in the current workforce? Anything that you see that your current you know, workforce might need help with um, a skill that the community college can kind of step in and offer that? Absolutely. Um, I mean, again, I think we're projecting out that there is going to be a lot of jobs around AI and ML um, and in, in just the field in general. I think I, I also just want to temper everything I'm saying with the fact that like Google just had a very public reduction in workforce. And so, you know, um, I think when we talk about just preparing folks for the jobs of the future, we want to think about like across the board and not just at Google. Um, but when I personally think of community colleges, and I'm a California native, um, I think a lot about, I think, what Jermaine brought up earlier, and it's less the skills that I think that community colleges can fill, and actually more that like the students' lived experience and the fact that community colleges are just quite honestly, the best place we could possibly go for diversifying our workforce. Um, that is really what I think 
the talent of community colleges and the gift that community colleges are, especially in California. Um, you know, we saw that about half of the students in the in the colleges you represent are Latinx, which is a huge percentage. Um, I'm actually pretty impressed by the amount of women in the programs that you have. We know that that's still an area that we're really trying to develop. And so that's really what I, you know, I think your unique contribution is and where we would like to be partnering um, a lot more to make sure that we're bridging any gaps um, that we need in providing services to students. Um, another thing that I think community colleges do really well and could do even better is providing so many supports um, services to students and wraparound supports to students. Um, and, you know, even more than curricular developments, I think that um, given everything that students have been through the past three years, that really is, a, a, again, unique differentiator for community colleges that you can take in students, understand kind of where they're coming from, um, the supports that they might need. And then um, something Linda said earlier, I just wanted to get back to, I think what makes um, this field really unique is that, you know, I'm gonna pick on like, my major was in Middle Eastern studies. I don't know what I was thinking, um, but <laughs> it doesn't, that doesn't change a ton, the foundation year to year, what is on the syllabus. You know, these, these fields just change so much. It's so hard to keep on top of. And so really having that open um, communication with industry so that the standards we're teaching and the curriculum we're teaching is really industry informed is so much more important in these spaces than in, in many other, you know, topics that are taught. Um, so Linda got into this a little bit, but I just think there's so many avenues that students can pursue now. There are, you know, being kind of self-taught, there's certificates, there's boot camps, there's apprenticeships, there's internships. Um, and I think it can be really daunting to students to try to put all of that together. Um, and in most cases, it's usually kind of some combination of those. And so I also think something that community colleges can be doing is um, either through counselors or faculty is maybe helping students navigate that. So understanding like, where does a student want to end up? Up, what are some options for them? Um, and then how can we kind of piece together an educational pathway that makes the most sense for them? For some students, it's going to be a certificate. Google has certificates programs. I know Microsoft does as well. Those certificates are all available online. Um, we have a brand new security certificate. So pursuing those, and I actually think there's a really good tie-in probably for community colleges with certificates, because then a company or the certificate, you know, provider is a um, supplying some of the curriculum that's industry informed, but then the community college can have the tie-in that really gives the support to students. And I think that is a really great relationship because students are getting everything that they need um, out of that to progress. And there's a really strong workforce tie-in. And for a lot of students, that's gonna be all they need for a career. Um, but then also for students who want a four-year career, how are we kind of aiding them in that transition and making sure that they have everything they need to persist and graduate. So I'll stop there. There's always more I could say about that, but um, I think, you know, this is, uh, community colleges are such a gift to us in so many ways and we need to figure out how to get it right. No, Sydney, great point. And one of the things that stood out to me is one thing that you mentioned is ICT continu continuously changes on, you know, year to year basis. So having that rapport with the community colleges is uh, something that we can definitely build on. And our team will definitely send a survey after to see how potentially we can kind of continue to collaborate with our community colleges. But thank you so much for the input. Uh, I'll pass it on to uh, Anika to see if she has anything to add to the question. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, thank you. Uh, so a couple of things, let me just preface before I start, you know, getting into my response. Uh, I want to um, raise my hand and, and acknowledge that the agency, particularly public agencies, uh, have a responsibility, a major responsibility as well to view IT uh, and IT related professions as less of a liability and more of an asset. We still have a, a very traditional view of IT is just, oh, those folks that spend money, they keep, you know, they keep stuff working, but they just spend money, you know? Uh, we need to really work on, I think the, maybe the academic community could help influence uh, the public sector's view of, um, of ITS. So that was one thing I wanted to just, you know, kind of put out there first. Um, we, um, I think there are many great, you know, and I'm not just GIS, but many great programs in general uh, related to uh, IT um, that are available. However, I think for the, um, to speak to the current employees that met, like agencies like Metro and, you know, other 
let's say public sector agencies, the, the challenge is usually access. It's a very traditional environment. It's, you know, nine to five or eight to five. And so a lot of these employees would be looking for things that would happen after, you know, after hours uh, or even, you know, even better, something that would happen on campus. So if there were more, I know that, I know that it exists, but if there were better advertising of probably after school um, or after our, you know, after traditional hour opportunities or better availability of after hour opportunities, I think, um, and particularly in IT, I think that you may get more uh, bite from um, the the traditional, the more traditional employees uh, in the public sector, um, um, you know, and particularly in uh, the, the area of geospatial competence. Um, uh, analytics in general, we have less need for consultants and more need for staff to actually be doing the work. Our CEO recently said that she's very focused on data and analytics as being the core of our decision making, which it should be anyway, but you know, she's really restated the importance of that. And so I think that uh, having an emphasis on, um, on the analytics, not just on the, the infrastructure related to you know, pulling together data, but also you know, the, the analysis itself, analysis and visualization, um, there is a need uh, for additional support there as well. Um, and the last thing I wanna just, um, underscore what uh, Sydney said about being better industry informed. I think that um, it's, again, it's easier to transition folks, to transition students into uh, our environment, or it's easier for, uh, for our staff to learn stuff, you know, the, uh, learn new things if there's a clearer understanding of what our industry does. And again, as I say, um, we have a role to play in that, in that we need to be, you know, more available as well to explain what our industry is actually doing. So, um, you know, just wanted to put that out there uh, as well. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Anika. Thank you. Great points and perspective from the side of LA Metro. Uh, segue it to Justin to see if he has any closing remarks. Yeah, um, I, I'll just say that I'm, I'm really happy again, just to be doing this. I think just doing this and creating that bridge from, well, I go back to say in my time at Michigan, uh, the thing that really sold me on being in this industry was seeing the real world application of what I was learning in school. And I was able to get my first internship at Microsoft uh, as a product manager, as a developer, as a software developer in test. Um, and I wasn't able to get that without, you know, Microsoft coming to our school and a bunch, along with a host of other companies, right, career fairs and having that exposure right? Like, oh, oh, I can do, oh, I can work on Xbox. Oh, I can work in on, I use Windows. I can work on Windows. Oh, okay. I can, I can make, you know, the Zoom, you know, RIP Zoom, but, uh, you know, I could, I could do those. That's what I can do with this skill. Oh, okay. And I can apply that at this company. I can make what, how much money, you know, all like all those things. I think at the community college level that I'm kind of learning, I don't know how much, you know, but I think, um, I think as Sydney mentioned, like, you know, community colleges in California, right, like, huge leg up, right, where this, you know, the the campuses and the facilities and the schools are in our backyards, right, of, of entertainment powerhouses, of tech powerhouses, of tech and entertainment powerhouses. So I think um, by sheer uh, exposure to these career paths from a personnel standpoint, right? Um, I think that there's, that's the advantage and what we should continue to try and amplify in showing these students that, hey, like you don't have to have, um, you know, this degree, this skill set, this thing to even have a shot at getting in the door at these places, right? Um, and you don't have to be, you know, uh, a technical expert. There's so many other, you know, areas of of him. I know we're talking about IT and ICT, but like there's so many other areas that um you know these companies and I put an asterisk behind this as well because you know it's just been a uh, a massacre of sorts and in, in terms of you know job reduction across the board. I think Apple has been the exception recently just because I think during the pandemic we didn't scale up as much as a lot of different companies, right? Banking on the environment that we were in. We've uh, instead been on a sort of hiring freeze in a lot of areas. Um, 
that said, again, though, th there's not just technical roles at these companies, right? And so um, I think the exposure uh, is the thing that is going to be beneficial along with everything else that we we said uh, and making sure students know that, hey, like, we're here, you can see yourself here, you know, um, you can see our path here, you can see your path here. Um, and um, I, I think that that is, uh, yeah, that that's, that's super beneficial. No, thank you, Justin. Agree with you. That's vital. Uh, the exposure, specifically starting at a young age as well, mm -hmm. is something that that's going to take them a long way. But thank you again for the feedback. As stated, Linda didn't need to step away. So I'll move on to another question. As you guys may know, uh, community colleges here representing 19 community colleges in the LA region. We have over 500,000 community college students, very diverse uh, ecosystem. So my question is, do you have any systems or programs in place to ensure you have access to and are cultivating a diverse workforce. Uh, so I'll, I'll actually start with Justin. Say it one, one more time, repeat that, sorry, I caught the- Yeah, I know it's a long question, but <laughs> do you have any systems or programs in place uh, to ensure you have access to and are cultivating a diverse work, workforce? Yes, uh, and so um, I'll speak to a couple and I want to um, uh, clerically and logistically uh, connect you, Jose, Mariana, and Jermaine to some other folks as I dig into personnel here at Apple, because we're so big, um, you know, I know we have some some additional folks focused specifically on uh, education in underserved communities and, you know, diversity and inclusion and, and all of that, right? So I'll, I'll bring them in, in the loop when appropriate, you know, uh, as we continue this conversation. Uh, but one thing I, I specifically got involved in, um, uh, is called the uh, Apple Developer Academy. Um, so uh, we have a few internationally, but we launched uh, the first one uh, in the States, in Detroit, in my hometown, actually. And what we're doing is um, we're uh, taking students um, from all uh, skill sets and economic and socioeconomic backgrounds, uh, particularly, you know, in underserved communities, uh, but uh, also in all demographics too, from an age standpoint, right? I think in, in the, the cohort this year, uh, youngest was uh, 18, uh, oldest was uh, in the 50s and 60s. Uh, but teaching the, the folks in the developer academy, not just hard development skills, like learning Objective-C or learning Swift UI to how to you know, build and code apps, uh, but just general problem solving skills from a product design and design in the real world you know, um, lens. You know, if there's a problem, how can you have the tools digitally to solve this? How can you craft a, a narrative, you know, and, and sell a story? Um, how can you break a problem down into meaningful chunks and steps? How can you work in a team to solve that problem? Uh, those are all the skills and the meta skills that are amplified along with some you know, uh, development skills, uh, concrete skills. You know, it's not necessarily a boot camp, coding boot camp. It's more of a holistic. How do we solve a problem with technology, right? And you know, with the hopes that that can, you know, introduce folks to this, um, this career path, these career paths, um, get a window into a door into these companies, or also, you know, give them the tools to uh, build out their projects and their ideas. Uh, and and going further into entrepreneurship. Um, so that's the Apple Developer Academy. Um, there are a number of uh, diversity recruitment, you know, efforts going on, again, that I'll um, dig into further and, and dig in that person there so we can bring folks in. Uh, but we are doing things like this. And I'm doing this today to start to be on the front lines of uh, complementing what we're doing officially with some of the kind of unofficial work and trying to bring that, you know, uh, together so we can, you all can get the full uh, breadth of the kind of efforts that are going on, even some of the things that I'm, I'm not even aware of right now. So uh, is that clear? Yeah, you know, thank you, Justin. Thank you for the work that you're doing and the work that Apple is doing. I'd like to segue to Linda. Uh, I see that you're back. So the question was, uh, do you have any systems or programs in place to ensure you have access to and are cultivating a diverse workforce? Yeah, one of the things that we do is through um, different segments, um, we have programs that target that very population. For instance, we have um, colleagues who focus on 
trying to cultivate that talent through the Hispanic population. So they build out partnerships through that. And then we also have um, partnerships with HBCUs for a number of our work in that space. But also on top of just building out those um, higher ed institution relationships as a part of the diversity in recruiting um, at that level, it's also looking at who we are partnering with in our local communities. Like here, I'll just use Greater LA as an example and looking at who we're partnering with in terms of in the nonprofit space. So, um, and the intentionality of funding some of those programs to have those re that reach. So, so we have very specific ones that are doing um, more of a place-based focused on areas that have been underserved. So we work in parts of East LA, South East LA, South, the Valley, both valleys, <laughs> whether it's you know San Gabriel or San Fernando, and also even going up to Antelope Valley, because all of those pieces, when we take um, take into consideration, you know, diverse, diversifying the talent, it's going back to the idea of looking at that pipeline and where are some of those gaps. So we support programming, especially now even for middle school students, because there is sort of like that idea of that missing middle in terms of we have these exciting programs for elementary school students. And then we do things for high school students that connect to let's say youth work source but the middle school students aren't getting that. And also at a very critical developmental period, um, there aren't as many opportunities. So how do we start our looking at diversity there and um, going into underserved communities? And the other thing that we have as programming is um, going into uh, what we call our TEALS program, which is um, volunteers going into um, high schools and partnering with high schools to build out their um, the, the CS pathway in particular. So they bring in industry um, partners. They do project-based learning, really um, adding a lot of components to it. It's really about building the capacity of teachers in low income and underserved areas that with um, underrepresented populations. And it isn't just volunteers from Microsoft. We actually volunteer, we have volunteers from a number of companies, even other tech companies um, that join. I think we lost you there, Linda. Um, but yeah I, yeah, I know we can attest here at LADC that Microsoft is doing great work in the community. Uh, Sydney, I'd like to pass it on to you uh, to close it. I also saw that you know, question that was presented in the chat by Vincent. I know you were able to answer, but you feel free to add on to that as well. Sure. Um, I just wanted to follow up on what Linda said and say that Teals is an amazing program. And I think what's so great about being here today is that um, I think for a long time, tech companies have kind of existed in a silo because we, we do compete for a workforce. And I really hope that we're getting to a place where we recognize that like there is plenty to go around and that we really have a responsibility to work together. And so I'm hoping that through venues like this, we actually can make some consortiums and actually like you know, maximize our impact by working together. Um, doing some of the same work. So Google was the first company to publicly release our um, hiring data in 2014. Going to be honest that in the last 10 years, like it is hard to move the needle because of the systemic issues that I think Linda actually brought up first. Like we see discrepancies starting in K through 12 that are pervasive and are difficult to overcome. But I think working with, um, consortiums like this when we can really like get in and supplement or complement the work that um, community colleges are doing, particularly for underrepresented students, that is the most powerful thing we can do. So my full time job is actually in education for social impact. So we, we break that up at Google by region. So I just focus on LA. Um, and within that, we want to partner at the K through 12 level, the post-secondary level, which is where we would see community colleges, and then at the workforce development. So there's some overlap in that as well. Um, but really investing in systemic changes. I think um, if I could kind of explain very briefly, like where we've been, the evolution has been for a long time. I think Google tried to stand up their own products and programs to maybe bridge this gap. We're moving toward a much more sustainable model that I'm excited about, where we really try to plug into experts in the field and then maximize the 
the impact that um, experts like all of you are having. So instead of you know starting from scratch, where can we plug in with industry experts and subject matter experts and actually just give them funding or in-kind donations or you know uh, engineers or space so that um, we can accomplish mutual goals. So I'm excited about this conversation. I hope this is the start of a conversation. I'll put my email in the chat. I'm happy to talk to anyone on this call um, about ideas about how we could work together and be a good partner in LA. So really thrilled again to be here. And, and yeah, I mean, you can look up everything Google's doing, but I would hope that this is a jumping off point for more things that we could do together, specifically with community colleges in greater LA. Definitely, Sydney. Definitely. Thank you so much. And I actually want to segue to Anika, who does have to step out, but she wants, she has some last remarks she wants to kind of inform the audience. So, Anika? Hi, thank you very much, uh, Jose. Um, so, there's a couple of things. So, there was a question earlier from, um, I forget the name of the earlier presenter, but he asked about um, the solution to the wage problem. And um, again, you know, the, it's, it's a multi party. Uh, response, a multi-party responsibility. And from the perspective of, you know, agencies like LA Metro, I think that there is, again, this legacy understanding of IT and what IT does and what IT is and what it isn't. And that has changed the same way that technology has changed, right? For example, GIS is properly uh, an ITS uh, uh, function in many ways. And that has not been accommodated in the way in which we screen applicants, the way in which we do our recruiting, our hiring, uh, et cetera. So I think um, there's a better understanding that's needed and maybe the uh, colleges uh, and universities can work with us uh, to help HR, our HR departments understand a bit better the various uh, sub-disciplines within ITS so that we, when we're looking for candidates, we know how to better uh, look for and recruit those candidates. Right. And that would give that would give rise to, you know, I, I think proportionally uh, give rise to uh, better and more competitive uh, uh, wage offerings. So that was one thing I wanted to share. And then the other thing I think you guys are talking about this when I stepped away uh, was the whole uh, uh, question about equity. Um, it sounded like that's what you're talking about, equity and um, how it relates to, um, you know, women, of course, and uh, also for uh, minorities. Um, I'm a proud minority and I'm a proud woman, you know, and I'm one of the, you know, the, the few of us that are brave enough to, you know, to stick it out in the environment. You know, um, I'm happy to see my boss is here with me as well. And she also, um, you know, is one of one of those, she's been in the industry for 40 or so years uh, and she, you know, stuck it out. Um, it is not as easy um, uh, as it, it might seem, just, you know, apply for an IT job and, you know, get in. It's not as easy as that. So it's, it's definitely an issue of equity. How do we address it? I think understanding the deficiency first. I think we kind of jump in sometimes and you know want to fix it, fix it, but we don't really understand the nature of the deficiency, the, the why, right? Uh, I mean, there's a whole litany of, of, of discussion uh, around that. Uh, so I won't get into that right now. But the other thing is purposeful recruit recruiting. Um, it is not, uh, Metro has shifted the way in which it has uh, um, uh, address its recruiting of individuals, just generally speaking, uh, in which we put a much more equity focused lens on the candidates that we select. So we put, for example, when we're doing advertising, we advertise to more uh, women-based um, um, uh, or, or, you know, for example, like, you know, the, the woman-based organizations um, that would be able to get the word out to uh, more women, more minorities, uh, et cetera, so that it's a more well-rounded uh, selection uh, of applicants uh, for us to choose from. Uh, again, some of the traditional channels tend to be very male-oriented uh, or male-focused or male-dominated. And so again, we're trying to step outside the box, you know, not to go into too much detail about how we recruit. So like I said, re-looking, re taking a second look or a better look at the deficiency and more purposeful recruiting. I think those are two key things that both the, the educational community and um, agencies like Metro um, uh, can do to change that, you know, imbalance that we have at present. So just wanted to share those those couple of things. Thank you all very, very much for having me and look forward to talking to you. Thank you so much, Anika. Great points and great points to all the employer partners. We thank you for your feedback. 
I actually want to segue to our senior director, Jermaine Hampton, for closing remarks, but thank you so much again. Thank you, Jose. So really, I, I think we've had a, a really great conversation today. I just want to thank all of our partners, the Los Angeles Regional Consortium, COE, Luke Meyer and his team. Um, also, obviously, all of our faculty, deans and presidents that may potentially be on the call as well. Um, thank you so much um, for the partnership. Um, are there any questions? Um, that's the other piece. Are there any questions? Any questions? Any questions? for our industry guests before we conclude. Jermaine, there was a few questions that uh, the registrant uh, put on the chat, uh, actually um, before registering. So I can ask if that's okay, if you guys wanna unmute once I ask the question. Um, first question is, we are interested in forming an advisory group for our four-year degree in cloud computing. Would anyone here wish to participate? I believe that came from Santa Monica College. So if the individual faculty or dean is here and wants to unmute, please feel free. I, I can do speak know to that, that really quickly. Yes, please. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off, Jermaine. Yeah. Oh, no, no. Thank you. Go so, ahead. Um, we have a, a vehicle for um, either advising on curriculum or reviewing curriculum. So again, my email's there. I'm happy to do a quick review of curriculum or partner with you to see what you want to do. And then where we've been able to use Googlers is, you know, if someone works in cloud computing and they're willing to advise, I can try to make that connection. So happy to do that. That's usually like an easy thing to do. Um, so certainly I hope that person follows up with me or yeah. anyone else. Uh, yeah. Sorry, sorry, Sunit, I didn't mean to cut you off. Um, yeah, we can um, provide that as well. And we've done that in partnership with um, some of the other community colleges already. So we'll be happy to support that. Good stuff. I do know that similar to uh, another sector, bioscience, they created an advisory group um, that went really well. And they are talking directly with industry partners um, up at LA Mission. And I think that that has been very beneficial for both the employers and then also the faculty that are involved in those conversations. So anything that we can do to um, kind of mimic that process, I think would be excellent. And, you know, LADC, we're happy to obviously um, lead the way for those conversations. Other, was that the only question, Jose, that was in the chat? No, you have a few questions, but I'll ask the other one. I think one of them was already asked in, in the chat regarding the Department of Energy uh, grant. Uh, but the other question is, are there any grants offered by the employer partners to support non-credit slash adult earner access to technology? I am happy to entertain any grant proposals. So, you know, I don't, this is not a resource flush environment, but I appreciate how scrappy the community colleges are. And I'm, you know, I'm delighted to kind of work on workshop something or co-create something with anyone who's interested. What we would do, we send you like a worksheet, we can work through it together and then see what that would look like. Excellent. Other, any other questions, Jose? I know we got five minutes. Mariana, if you would like, could you please launch the, we have a poll, I think that needed to be launched as well. We can go ahead and launch that before we lose too many more folks. Um, here we go. Thank you so much. Our, your feedback is very important to us because we immediately mobilize that feedback um, in terms of any changes or updates that we need to make to presentations and other information that we're sharing today as well. Um, other questions, any other questions? We got four minutes left. I'll, I'll give folks back some time if there are no other questions. Any other questions? Okay. We got some comments and some, it looks like some uh, follow-up that will transpire. Um, once again, on behalf of LADC and our partners, um, thank you again, Google, Apple, our partners over at Microsoft, always a pleasure. And then obviously LA Metro as well. Thank you all so much um, for engaging in this very beneficial conversation with our college faculty um, across the LA 19. Thank you all so much. We will follow up um, with some next steps. We'll connect folks by email. Um, we'll provide key takeaways as well. And for those that were not, unable to join this call today, um, thank you all so much. Um, and please contact us if you have any questions that were not answered in this presentation. Um, Take care. Three minutes back to your days.
Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Thanks so much. Have a good one, everyone.